for taking the time out for our My Health 2 webinar. We're going to get started in just one moment. Welcome everyone to the My Health 2 Health Series webinar sponsored by Moffitt Cancer Center in partnership with the USF Black Alumni Society. We'll get started in just one moment. Thank you guys for joining. Welcome everyone. We're just waiting for everyone to join. We're going to get started in just one moment. Thank you for taking time out to join the My Health 2 health series conversation. Today we'll be discussing health screenings. This is a partnership with Moffitt Cancer Center and the USF Black Alumni Society. Welcome everyone. We are just getting started in just one moment for the My Health 2 webinar series. We're allowing everyone to have an opportunity to join to hear great information. All right, everyone, thank you for joining the My Health 2 webinar series. We're going to get started in just one moment. Um, thank you for taking the opportunity and the time to join. And we'll go ahead and begin. Thank you that we're, everything's being turned over to Lashante Keys, who's going to be our moderator for today. And we welcome Dr. Tibby as well as Kenesha Avery. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as you said, my name is Lashante Keys, a proud alumni of the University of South Florida. As you know, USF Black Alumni Society, in partnership with the Moffitt Cancer Center, has presented and will present a few more a days, few days of informative and much needed conversations within our Black community. Yesterday, we had a remarkable conversation discussing cancer screenings and prevention with Dr. Blue and Dr. Ewing which if you missed it, you can find on the USF Black Alumni Society Facebook page and USF Alumni Association website, which is www.usfalumni.org in the on-demand section. So please be sure to check it out because it was a lot of great information that was given during that conversation. And today you're gonna to get even more information as well. Today, we'll have another interesting dialogue as we discuss health plus oral screenings with Dr. Tibby and Ms. Avery. At this point in time, I'm gonna have Dr. Tibby introduce herself and Ms. Avery will be joining us shortly. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for having me. My name is Dr. TK Tibby. I'm a pediatric dentist. I'm also the dental director at Tampa Family Health Centers and I'm a USF alumni 2011 with my master's in public health. So happy to be here, proud bull. That's what's up. Good looking out. Hey, proud bull. All right. Sounds good. Sounds good. So obviously in dealing with what made you get into dentistry? Because mm -hmm. when I, you know, when I look back on it, I know we have representation on television with doctors. We have them with nurses. You know, you can think all the way back to Diane Carroll, who was mm -hmm. a nurse back in the 60s on the television show. You can think to Bill Cosby. But I don't, I'm trying to think, I don't ever recall seeing a black dentist on any TV show. So what made you get into dentistry? Well, I was very fortunate um, because for me, my main influence is my father. Um, and he had a really hard road as, as far as his oral health is concerned, very limited access. Um, he grew up poor um, in Jamaica. And so all along, I knew that I wanted to do something to improve people's oral health because what we see overwhelmingly even today is that if you're born poor, um, a lot of times you just don't have access to care. And in his case, he lost all of his top teeth by the time he married my mother. But the funny thing is, my mom always tells me, because back in those days, they only 
saw each other on the porches like when they dated they never really did meet overnight as we would say um so she said whenever you meet a guy make sure you check his teeth his teeth and of course his credit so my dad she never knew my dad was missing all his top teeth um and now he has implants and he has a denture but before then you know it's something that was i think a little embarrassing for him um, so I always knew that I wanted to do something to improve oral health and to make sure that other people don't suffer the same fate as my dad just because of their poor. Nice. Okay. All right. And if you all have any questions to the audience, please be sure to put them in the chat. Um, we also have a Q&A section that you can ask as well. So please, let's ask an abundance of questions. And we already have one question as well um, that has already come in, which is great. When should children start getting their first oral health screening? Okay, that's a really good question. I'm glad you asked. So I'm a pediatric dentist. And so what we recommend is that um, you should bring your child to the dentist at age one. Um, really, the cutoff is six months after their first tooth erupts. And then some babies are born with teeth. So if they're born with teeth, you want to bring them in right away. Um, but usually 12 months is when you want to bring them in. And that's mainly just to talk with the mom or dad or caregiver about their oral health and how to prevent cavities from forming. Usually you don't see decay at age one. And so that, that age one dental visit, if you bring your child in, you're going to prevent problems down the road. And we've seen like a reduction in the overall dental care costs. So a child that's seen at age one is 40% less likely to have caries and less like, likely to have a large bill as well later on in life. So it's really going to reduce those um, healthcare costs. Okay, perfect. Can you tell us when you don't take care of your mouth, what are some of the things that you can look forward to <laughs> if you're not taking proper care of your mouth? <laughs> I was going to say, you get to see me, but hopefully you get to see me either way, whether you're taking care of your mouth or not. Um, but we're seeing a lot of patients accessing care on um, on emergency basis. And with the pandemic, that's happened increasingly more because people are just afraid um, to come in. And for a while, we weren't offering um, many of our services. We only were doing emergency care, nothing preventative. Um, but now we've resumed operations across the state. Um, in our health center at Tampa Family, we're open at all 10 locations now for patients. So we want you to get in, get that well checkup before the end of the year. Let's find out what's going on. If you don't come in, it just means you're kicking the can down the road. And so a lot of things that you could treat early, like a, you know, a hole in your tooth, it's only going to grow if you don't come in. It'll get deeper and deeper and then reach the nerve eventually, and then it can cause you pain and infection. So what we try to do is kind of prevent things from happening, early detection of decay, uh, treat that disease process so it doesn't advance. And if you do need to have teeth removed, it doesn't benefit, benefit you to wait either. So you should get in um, sooner than later. Okay. And I think you mentioned earlier, somebody wanted clarity. What are caries? Oh, sorry. Dental cavities. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah, dent, uh, decay. No, 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 you're good. Trust me. That's what we're here for. We're here to get this free advice and learn. Because mm -hmm. I think the one thing that allows us to have these conversations is we get to learn some of the terminology as well. Because mm -hmm. I think sometimes when we go into situations, we don't have the right terminology. Somebody may say something. So, no, we love it when you give clarity on exactly yeah. what the terminology is. Because it makes me look like I know what I'm talking about when I go in. So, okay. uh, <laughs> good. Let's welcome Miss um, Avery to the, to the panel. How are you doing, Miss Avery? I'm well. How are the two of you? Good, good, good. Welcome. If you can't introduce yourself um, to our to our panel, I mean to our guest. Okay. So I'm Kanisha Avery. I'm the program manager in the Office of Community Outreach Engagement uh, at Moffitt. And sorry, I'm not a Bulls alumni. I went to FAMU, but I have my master's in public health. <laughs> look, I'm, I'm, look, this is a great panel because I'm also an alumni. <laughs> I'm an alumni FAMU and USF. Oh, okay. Well, look, we're gonna have a good time here today. This is, this is great. <laughs> Ms. Avery came in right on time. All right. So if you can explain exactly what do you do at Moffitt? I know you gave your title, but what exactly do you yes. do? So I kind of make sure we move. So let me just back up. So uh, a couple of years ago, well, in 2018 at Moffitt, we established this office. And this was a direct mandate from the National Cancer Institute that all comprehensive cancer centers have a way that we're able to go into those vulnerable populations and those communities to hear their voice and understand what their cancer needs are and relate that message to the cancer center. So um, our office, again, was established in 2018 and I came aboard as the program manager to kind of make sure we meet that, that need and that demand of making sure the voices of those vulnerable populations, including those, uh, the black population, 
that it's heard throughout our research, throughout our outreach, and throughout our education. Okay, perfect. And so what are some of the things that you're hearing? What are some of the things that you have heard in your time with Moffitt Cancer Center? So the number one thing we wanted to make sure is that we understand their needs and what their priorities are. So we actually did a deep dive into the data to look at what are those top cancers that's affecting uh, those vulnerable populations. And when I say vulnerable populations, for Moffitt, it is the African-American community being our largest minority group. Um, the Hispanic population, which is our largest ethnicity uh, group, and then the elderly, those that are 65 and older, um, the patients living with uh, HIV or persons living with HIV and also those rural counties. So when you, you talk about the Black community, those top three cancers that are affecting us are uh, colorectal, breast, and prostate. And so, and also looking at, so that's for as far as incidents. So the number of new cases we see every year, those are the top three. And then when you look at the number of Blacks that are dying from cancer, you, it's those top three, but it's also cervical cancer. Mm -hmm. And so, and looking at what those cancers are and then asking the community, what are their needs? So as far as the, the community driven needs, it's access like transportation and barriers, those things that are prohibiting them to actually have the care they need or even get the detection and screenings so that they can see early on. So that's one of the things in the Black community is that we don't get screened as early. So when we are screened, it's at a later stage and our outcomes are not as, as bad, bad as compared to other communities. So it's access to care, um, looking at those social determinants of health that's um, those barriers that we could possibly address. And then, like I said, bringing that back to Moffitt to see what we can do. Okay, perfect. So those are, so looking at, you know, what their social needs are, as well as what are those cancers in the community that we could possibly address to um, improve their health outcomes. Okay, perfect. And I think just like Dr. T.B. said, I think that might be the same thing even with dentistry, it's just access to care and just, mm -hmm. you know, things of that nature. I know we had a question last time um, for you um, from the audience. What are key cancer screenings Blacks should get to lower the cancer incident and mortality rates if detected early? So again, really looking at those three cancers that are really running rapid in our community. So getting your mammograms. So it's starting at age 40, um, when you turn 40, make sure you get that mammogram. And if you're at higher risk, we're finding that a lot of African Americans have hereditary breast cancer. And so making sure even if you're below the age of 40, but you have your mom or your sister or a first cousin that had breast cancer to make sure that you do get those screenings. And then also um, if you're below that 40 and you have those risk factors that you get genetic counseling um, prior to so that you can make the best decisions as to when you should get that screening. So also for the men, prostate cancer, and not just um, the, blood, the blood test, but also that rectal exam. And we wanna start that as far as African-American men at the age of 45. So I know a lot of times they'll say 50, but you wanna make sure because of our genetics um, that we start at 45. And then for colon cancer, it's 50. But again, if you have, if you are at higher risk, you can get it prior to the age of 50. Okay, perfect. And just, and just real quick, just want to get clarity. I think you said something about genetic counseling. And just to get mm -hmm. clarity, what exactly is genetic counseling? So that's when you uh, get your blood drawn and then you, they look at to see what uh, cancers you may be predisp predisposed to based on your genetic makeup. And so um, I am a breast cancer survivor and thank God I do not have the BRCA1 or 2 uh, gene that predisposes you to breast cancer, um, but that will help those for early detection, especially again, like I said, if you um, have the family history of it. All right, perfect, perfect. Now, just for some of us who are, because it kind of popped in my mind real quick, when you say that you're a breast cancer survivor, how do we respond to that? Because I know a lot of times we don't know how to respond to it. Like, 
do we say congratulations? Do we say <laughs> good job? Like, how do we, what's the best way for somebody to respond to it? That's good. Congratulations. Um, so it, it, congratulations is in order. Um, I caught it early. I turned 40 and my gynecologist said, well, you turned 40 this year. So let's, you know, get your mammogram. And from that one mammogram turned into, you know, I was diagnosed early at stage zero. Um, so, but that is, it's in order. And I, I tell the story because I want more women, especially, especially African-American women to get screened early. Um, don't wait. And actually at the age of 16, I found my first um, cyst. So I had, I had a fibrocystic breast early on. And so I always paid attention to my, my body. And just through self breast exam, I found it, had surgery at 16, at 18, and then at 40 was diagnosed with um, breast cancer. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Tibby, can sinus issues, this is from the audience, can sinus issues contribute to poor dental health? Yeah, I would say it does. Um, you know, we right now we're realizing that, you know, the mouth and the nose are connected as a pathway, right? So um, some dentists are actually bridging into um, sleep apnea and other um, forms of management because we're seeing an impact um, between patients who may grind their teeth and have sleep apnea. So um, they're thinking that the body is just trying to like wake you up. And so you're gritting your teeth to kind of get that air moving. So there is um, interaction between what's happening with sleep apnea and your oral health. Um, and then kids who have asthma, people who have other chronic sinus conditions um, may have a higher rate of caries as well because they may be mouth breathers. So if your mouth is dry, then your teeth aren't being lubricated and you're not cleansing your, um, your mouth. So you have a likelihood to have food kind of hang around and then that can break down um, into sugar and your, the bacteria in your teeth use that to make acid and to make cavities or caries on your teeth. So it's all connected. Um, so in fact, people sometimes say when they have a toothache, it hurts like in their sinuses and it's because the roots of your teeth go into your sinuses. So everything's kind of connected. Oh, interesting. Okay. Another question for the audience. My son has little to no enamel on his baby mm -hmm. teeth. What can we do to help build his enamel on his permanent teeth as they start to come in? So I would say two things. Having Thin enamel on primary teeth is normal in the sense that it's thinner coating of enamel than the adult teeth. That's just the anatomical feature. Um, and that's why with baby teeth, even though people say it's not important to, you know, to see a dentist and get those filled, you should because the enamel is kind of the outer hard covering. And if that gets eaten through by the cavity, then it gets to the next level. And then the next level after that is the nerve. So you have more issues. So thinner enamel is a normal um, property of a baby tooth. And so getting those cavities fixed early is important. But if your child has a condition like a dental neogenesis imperfecta or a melogenesis imperfecta, and these things run in families sometimes, um, any other um, conditions like blue sclera or blue tinge in the eyes, any bone issues, like I don't know if you guys follow, um, I think his name is Byron. He's a little kid that has um, OI, osteogenesis imperfecta. He's, he has his own little um, channel on YouTube. So those are some conditions that are associated with thin enamel. So you may want to get checked by the dentist. Um, there's really nothing you can do to prevent the second teeth, the second set of teeth, so your permanent teeth, from having that same condition if it's genetic. But what you can do is prevention, prevention, prevention. So if you know that your child has thin enamel in the baby teeth and you're worried about the secondary or permanent teeth having the same thing, getting in early to the, doc the dentist, um, having fluoride treatments, um, having more frequent um, checkups and x-rays to prevent any decay and treat it early. Um, so nothing you can do, but I would just say fluoride and then prevention. Perfect. Question to both of y'all. What happens if something is detected during the screening? What are the next steps? And what if I'm uninsured? So um, I didn't get to mention earlier when she was talking about all the um, different cancers, but we're seeing an increase in oral cancer. So in particular, oral pharyngeal cancer. And a lot of these cancers we're noticing, you know, most cancers are preventable, right? If we do what we should, don't smoke, don't drink, Get our regular screens we can prevent them and in your case miss avery it was great that you were doing the right thing to self-examine and to see your doctor so catching them early um, as well in whatever stage that they present so with oral pharyngeal cancer we're seeing an increase um, so oral cancer you know your lip your tongue um, this is the cancer of the throat i'm talking about so oral pharyngeal cancer we're seeing an increase and it's not just related to tobacco and um, alcohol it's also related to um, hpv 
So um, it's important that we get these screenings because you just never know things can get worse. So I'd say st first start finding out what's normal for you in your mouth, you know, get a baseline of what's normal, establish with a dentist, a dental home, someone to examine you on a regular basis and to watch lesions to see if you're changing. And if you happen to go to a screening and you don't have insurance and you find out that you need other care, there's a lot of free services. So where I work at Tampa Family, we can loop you in to um, our health system because we have a lot of providers um, that can help to treat you and refer you out. And we charge you based on your income. We can also help you get insurance because a lot of times people are underinsured. They have just not applied for um, any of the Obamacare plans or look to see if they're qualifying for Medicaid. So that's one option. But I would never let fear cripple, cripple you because some people say, I just don't want to know because I don't have the resources. There's so much that's available and that's free. I would say take the next step. Um, don't worry about the what's if. Just go ahead and do it. Get screened. It's for your health and for your benefit. Um, at Moffitt, we have a voucher program for breast, lung, and prostate, um, and that's for the uninsured population that we cover those expenses. Uh, and if, they're, if they do find abnormal uh, findings from their screening, we do have a charity care program that can cover their expenses for follow-up care. All right, perfect. So, what, so you're both saying that nobody should go even if they don't have insurance, they don't have the money, nobody should really be going out here in pain, suffering, or, you know, or sometimes we hear this in our community a lot of times, well, I got to die some way, you know, type yeah. thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. So we do, you know, we hear it a lot. Okay. But you're saying that there are things out there that can allow people to, okay, perfect. We'd love to hear that. Okay. Here's another question. Given that we are a long way removed from wooden teeth and all people getting dentures, in today's world, should real teeth last a lifetime oh, wow. so um, I'm a big believer my god my grandfather God rest his soul passed away with all his teeth and his nickname was teepee believe it or not so I think um, you know once again dental like caries cavities it's preventable it's completely related to your diet um, your oral hygiene you know how you take care of yourself so yes the expectation that I have is that you know if you're linked into care early like that age one dental visit for your child you keep them going to the dentist we can have a lifetime of healthy teeth. Now, um, that's not always the case. Maybe you've lost some teeth here or there, but we try to save teeth when possible, when it makes sense. So yes, it's possible to have your teeth for a lifetime, um, but you've got to have develop good habits, healthy habits, healthy diet, um, and you've got to get plugged into a dentist. And I also believe in fluoride, which is a naturally occurring substance. It's in your toothpaste that you can get and use. I recommend brushing with a, to a fluoride toothpaste and also fluoride water as well. Now, are there certain toothpastes to look out for? So I know you said fluoride and there's, you know, yeah, so different I actually, prices for different things. So. Yeah, some people are just not, are, they're opposed to fluoride. But I think because some of the studies that have come out, you know, have been a mixed bag and people that are mostly vocal are against it. But I think the majority who supports it and that sees the benefit of it, like myself being a public health dentist, um, it definitely outweighs um, any risks that are associated. It's very minimal risk. And so I believe that it's important to have fluoride in your regimen. So for people who have high risk for cavities, I'd recommend using a fluoride toothpaste. So anything that you buy like a Colgate or Crest, I'm not endorsing either one of those, but just make sure it has at least um, uh, fluoride in that product. And then um, a fluoride mouthwash. So if you have a child, like my daughter has braces. So in addition to having the fluoride toothpaste, I have her on a fluoride mouthwash as well, just because it's harder for her to clean. Um, so if you have a, patient, a child that's asthmatic, they're at higher risk of having caries as well. Anyone that has any like dry mouth syndromes, you maybe want to layer on um, a fluoride mouthwash in addition to that. So I'm a big proponent of fluoride toothpaste and fluoride products for prevention. All right, perfect. Thank you. Ms. Avery, a question for you. What is being done to address and close the cancer health disparities gap among Blacks? So at Moffitt, we're doing a number of things. We do have a, um, relating to HPV and just following up on Dr. Tibby's point about the oral uh, cancers, HPV is cause, causes those oral cancers um, in addition to cervical cancer. And so again, going back to my initial statement is that uh, African-American women are dying at higher rates from cervical cancer. And so each year, and this will be our second year, we actually um, host the HPV Awareness Summit. Um, last year, we hosted it with the American Cancer Society. This year, we're hosting with Advent Health. 
Um, and we're really trying to push the HPV vaccinations for adolescents. Um, we have in, a, in our lifetime a chance to eliminate a cancer and we're choosing to do cervical cancer. If we can get persons or um, parents to get their children vaccinated. So we're really having a big push around there and working with providers across the state as well as our um, community outreach people to really push and uh, increase persons awareness of HPV um, prevention and vaccination. Um, we're also trying to increase um, the minority accruals in clinical trials because we do know that a lot of times, and if you can look at now with the COVID-19 vaccination, um, we're, we're genetically different. We're not the same as all, all, no races are the same. And so without having those persons um, in those clinical trials, we don't know if those vaccinations or those treatments are as effective based on their genetics. So we're establishing a um, committee to address how we address or um, approach or include African-Americans in our efforts to increase the accrual of African-Americans in clinical trials. We also have a uh, faculty oncology program where we help to recruit and retain African-Americans as far as uh, clinicians Moffitt. We have a health disparities uh, interest group where it's across Moffitt and all the research programs where we're trying to create um, programs and research specifically for African-Americans. We also have a Be Great Community Advisory Panel. It's a, a panel of mostly African-American women who are breast cancer survivors who we're wanting their input on um, recruitment for uh, patients and studies, as well as educational materials tailored to the African-American women, increasing their awareness of ovarian and breast cancer. So there are a lot of things that we're trying to do at Moffitt um, just to increase the, the awareness and the education and the importance of screening um, of uh, those prevention methods of healthy eating, exercising, um, and as well as research. All right, perfect. Thank you. Hmm? A question to a question Dr. Tibby, to Dr. and it seems like yes, it's going to be the same, same one, one in, a in a sense. As an older, as an older person, person, you have to get have in a tooth extracted. How, how important is it to get implants? implants. And then we have a follow-up question, follow -up question as, well. as well. If you have if you missing have, teeth, would you strongly, would you strongly recommend, recommend dental implants? implants. Oh, okay. So two things about implants. So for the first one, I'm getting like an echo. I'm not sure if it's yeah, same here. Maybe, maybe everybody can mute besides the speaker. Um, so as far as implants, I think I forgot the second question, so I may have to have you repeat it. So as far as implants, so um, again, I think I mentioned my dad has gotten implants just um, to help retain his denture, but it's not a necessity. So implants are another level there. Um, people prefer them because they say it feels more like having natural teeth, but nothing beats having natural teeth. Um, so you want to try to save them when we can. But implants are a more costly um, way of getting uh, teeth replacement. Uh, so where we are at Tampa Family right now, we do offer dentures, um, but implants we're not providing at this time. However, if you want to look into getting implants, that is another viable way of restoring um, form and function. It's a little bit more expensive than the dentures. But it's not a requirement um, to have a venture. What was the second question, Lashante? It was pretty much the same. It was going in the same fold. They both were asking about implants and the importance of implants at a certain age. And then do you strongly recommend dental implants? Yeah. So I wouldn't say I strongly recommend that. I think when they're indicated and it makes sense to get them, then I would say yes. And I recommend that you see either a periodontist who's a gum specialist or a dental oral surgeon for that. All right, we have another question from the audience. How do you get rid of fibroids? What are my options as I'm in my 40s and, I have, and I'm have and i having long painful cycles with blood clots? Sorry. So I'm not a clinician, um, so I don't want to say what your best treatment option would be, but I do know um, diet and, you know, sometimes if they're even in the cases of removal, um, but your doctor would be the best. So I don't want to 
answer and not, you know, give wrong information. No, we definitely understand that one because, <laughs> yeah, don't get yourself in trouble because, right. yeah, because look, they'll be quick to be like, what Miss Avery says. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, I don't want, I don't want to do that. Look, I totally understand. But again, um, but we do have other individuals. So if you can't get your question answered here, please email us and we'll get it to somebody within the Moffitt Cancer Center because that's what this partnership is all about. Because you may have missed out on some of the conversations before and you have a question like you may come in tomorrow and want a question about dentistry. We would definitely be able to reach out to individuals to get you those questions answered. So again, if you can't get it answered here, we will try our best to get, you, get your question answered somewhere. All right, here's another question. How many strands of HPV virus are there and does the vaccine cover all? Am I muted? Oh, sorry. So there are multiple strands of HPV. However, there are six cancers that they have identified that, um, that are caused because of the HPV virus. So, um, and right now, the only screening that they're doing or the ones that's available now is for cervical cancer through the pap test. And um, so that's, where, that's currently what's uh, going, that's currently what's on the market now. Um, and then the, the vaccination is also for cervical, well, it's not for cervical cancer, but that's, like I said, the testing is for that, the screening. So there are six cancers. So is that the question or the strands? I think it was the strands. Yeah, so there are multiple. I don't recall the number of how many exactly I can get that, but there are six cancers that are caused by the, the virus. And most of the, um, when you do get HPV, a lot of times it clears on its own, but these are the six that they have identified. Perfect. Um, here's a question. And I think we all were kind of concerned about this. And I think some of us are still concerned, especially in COVID times. Is it safe to go to the dentist during COVID? What protections are being done in the office to make a dental visit safe? That is a wonderful question. So um, yes, it is safe. I think it's probably one of the safest places to go now because we've taken all the necessary precautions um, to make sure that your visit is safe. So in a Tampa family, uh, that starts with screening every patient before they come in the building for COVID-19 via a screening and screening form and taking their temperature. Um, secondarily, we also, um, every patient comes through, we have them socially distanced and the appointments are spread apart. Um, each patient does a pre-rinse and they, um, we, we actually have our N95 masks that we wear. Um, and then we have machines now that will actually suction the air and clean the air when we have any aerosol. So I know most people know that this is now a, airborne uh, virus. And so where it could spread in the dental office is when we do any sort of drilling that would make aerosol, like spray. So we actually have uh, what are called ADS machines and UV lights that we actually kill the virus and treat the virus. We also have HEPA filters and hypochlorous acid. And then our staff wear masks throughout their time there and we clean and disinfect in between every patient. So for us, right away, we developed a protocol. We made sure that we did everything right um, to bring patients back safely and to also keep our staff safe. So it is completely safe to return to your dentist's office. Um, I'd say if you have any direct questions for them, I can vouch for my office. If you have any direct questions for your dentist, I would ask them, but most dentists have a plan on their websites or they will be open to any kind of conversations you wanna have regarding their care during COVID. But please go back, it's safe. Um, we, we need you to come back to, to keep your health, to keep your teeth healthy and your mouth healthy. Most definitely. Um, what are your thoughts about teeth whitening? Another question for the audience. Hmm. This is a great uh, conversation. So I'm, I definitely believe in teeth whitening. However, first things first. So, you know, before you can get your teeth whitened, they're using hydrogen peroxide uh, components. Um, and you want to make sure that you don't have any holes in your uh, teeth. You don't want to whiten teeth that have holes or decay. So the first things first is that you want to go ahead and get a regular checkup with your dentist, get a cleaning with your dentist, um, and then get any, any necessary dental work done before you start whitening your teeth. But yes, I believe in teeth whitening. I think it makes you feel better about your smile. It's a good thing. Another question. Will having a missing tooth cause a shift in your teeth? So I'll answer that on two levels. So with you know, I am a pediatric dentist, so definitely yes. So with baby teeth, for example, um, what really matters is that you keep the teeth 
um, that are from your canines, so your eye teeth, all the way back when it comes to baby teeth. Losing a front tooth is not as important as losing like the canine tooth, which is the cornerstone of your mouth, or a molar. Um, and remember, baby teeth are important because they're going to guide in the permanent teeth. So losing a baby tooth early can lead to crowding an adult teeth. So we really don't want that. And then for adults, when you lose a tooth, yes, your teeth, we say teeth are like, you know, kindergartners. They want to touch each other. They want to have something to bite against top and bottom, like kindergartners don't bite each other. Sorry. So this, that's as far as that analogy goes, but they want to be able to touch each other, have a tooth next to them, have a tooth above them, and that kind of keeps them in balance. Um, and so if you lose a tooth early, then teeth do tend to shift. Um, they may tip over. Um, they may grow longer from the top down. So that's why it's important um, to get replacements, whether it's bridge, dentures, and in the case of implants, um, you want to replace them when possible to maintain your, um, your arch or your, you know, how your teeth are shaped or how they come together in your mouth. So it's important to maintain them. All right. These are some great questions come from the audience. Here's another one. How do you choose the best doctor if diagnosed with cancer? My advice is to pick one that you feel comfortable with. Um, and that's first and foremost because they're, you know, you need someone you can trust and that you have that rapport with. So, and make sure that you are getting your answers, your questions answered, and they're providing the support you need because there'll be a lot of things that are thrown at you as a patient and you know, it's overwhelming. And so you wanna be able to feel comfortable enough to establish that relationship and ask the questions you need answered to. All right, perfect. Another question, I think is a follow-up to the teeth whitening. Um, so white strips don't really work, question mark. <laughs> okay, so I, have used white strips, so they normally are for, they're limited in where they would reach. So what I recommend if you are gonna bleach your teeth, um, rather than do something at home, um, is to actually see your dentist, get that checkup, and they can make a custom tray um, where you can put the, the, um, the whitening solution in the tray, um, and it will be a better effect than using the whitening strips. Whitening strips can work, but again, I would give you first to make sure you go to your dentist, get checked out, and make sure you have no holes in your teeth, and then you can use them under the supervision of your dentist. And again, they would only reach maybe the first six teeth, like your front six teeth. They're not going to extend all the way to the back, um, but they can work. They have to stay in contact with your teeth for the time that's indicated. Another question. What systematic, systematic health conditions can be detected in the mouth during an oral health screening? Wow, you guys with these wonderful questions. So we say that the mouth is a window to the overall body. So, you know, we've detected many things um, from just looking at a person's mouth. Um, so we sometimes will find viruses in the mouth, whether it be uh, herpes from papillomavirus. We may find metastatic cancers in the mouth. Um, some drying um, health conditions like diabetes may present first in the mouth. Um, you may have uh, periodontal disease because of diabetes. Um, we may find a patient that has abnormal lesions and we may ask for follow-up testing. I know that when I was um, a student, we diagnosed a patient with HIV because of some um, sarcomas that were discovered. So it's very interesting what you'll find in the mouth. Um, it definitely is a window. And remember, the same blood that goes to your teeth and gums goes to the rest of your body. So it's not a surprise um, that we're going to see that some of these things do show up in the mouth. A great question. <laughs> And I think with this series, we, we learn so much about just maintaining your body because somebody else can detect it. Because what you just said, you know, never knew that you could detect it from your mouth by going to the dentist. And I think in our last series, the, we had a chiropractor on and he detected, hey, I can tell if you, you know, you may possibly have cancer based on when I'm looking at your back and there's something in your back that I could discover. So, I mean, these are great tools that we have to learn that just because you're not going to the doctor, you need to maintain something and somebody will discover something about you if, if you're doing the right maintenance to keep your body. So th this is great insight. Um, Ms. Avery, if there's a specific specific doctor at Moffitt I want to see, can I request them? Yes, you can. So you can request, so there's no limitations. And I'm sure the next question is, how would they request them? <laughs> <laughs> so we do have, I don't have the um, the number, but we do have a main Moffitt line that you can go. You can do it um, online or you could do it by phone. 
to get in contact right. with them. Perfect. Another question, what type of doctor should you see for recurring mouth blister? So I would say start with your dentist, you know, because I think um, we can look and see what may be causing it and do our best work up and best guess and then refer you out. Um, so it could range, you know, based on what the, the cause of that blister is, you know, if it's something, um, you know, say it's a, it's a herpes lesion, um, maybe you have some immunocompromised issues going on um, or stress. Um, but we, I think the dentist will do a good job at least um, pointing you in the right direction. So I would start with your dentist and then have them refer you out if it's something that we think needs to get a second um, opinion. All right. A question to both of you. How do uninsured people take advantage of the free screenings offered by both of your agencies? So with our voucher program, we do have uh, certain restrictions based on the disease state, but for all of them, you have to be below the poverty level. Um, and then the lung is based on the number of packs of uh, cigarettes you smoke. So there are certain criteria um, that you must meet in order to uh, become a part of the, um, the program or to receive that voucher but I'm more than happy to um, share that information because like I said, each program is different based on the um, disease site. I think they put it in the chat. So for us, Tampa family, I would say just walk into our doors, call our call center um, to make an appointment because we would see you, you can become a part of our healthcare system by just being in the books. Um, that's both for dental and medical, and we don't deny care to anyone. So we really are here for the community, and we'll get you on a slide scale fee based on your income, um, or see if you qualify for insurance. Another thing I wanted to point out is that we do offer a lot of free screenings in the community. So we do have um, two dental mobile buses, and we have portable equipment. So if your child is in a Title I school in Hillsborough County, um, one thing you can do to make sure that they get to, get to be seen in school by Tampa family is sign the permission slip that comes um, either by peach jar or in your child's backpack if it makes it home. Um, that's a free service that we offer to all children um, from Head Start pre-K up to fifth grade. Uh, they can get dental cleanings, uh, screenings, of course, fluoride and sealants in, while they're in school if they sign that form. Okay, nice, good to hear. Another question. Um, what type of screenings do you recommend? That's not a finished question, I'm sorry. I was reading and didn't see the whole thing. Um, let's go on to the next one. Um, and this is just a shout out. Um, I had an appointment with a female black dentist for the first time this year. It was a great experience, girl power. So my question to you though, because like I said, there's very limited black dentists. What is being done to encourage individuals to go into dentistry? I know you said you had your father, but then what if somebody what is what is being done in that realm? Now, my dad wasn't a dentist. You just grew up. Oh, I'm sorry. An inspiration. <laughs> so I will tell you that I'm on a Facebook group with over 2,000 um, African-American dentists. I have one that I was just chatting with that's here to support me today. So thank you, Dr. Karen, for joining. Um, so I think what we have to do is create a pipeline. I mean, our, our kids are gifted. It's just a matter of steering them into those careers. And then, you know, for me, I had that passion, but I like to put dentistry in front of people as a career option. So... Um, I think we just have to do a better job of, um, you know, promoting it because it is a great career for anyone and for um, African-American women, especially, I think it's a great life balance. Um, so I think there is a myth that we don't gravitate there, but I think we just have to kind of encourage students to think about that. Um, and you are real doctors when you are dentists, <laughs> just so you know, and I think you have a better lifestyle, quality of life. Um, there's less litigiousness, like less lawsuits. And I think you get the instant benefit and gratification. It's like, part art, you know, part uh, mechanical. So using all your skill sets. And you can call me if anybody in the audience is thinking about a career or you have a child that wants to become a dentist, I give my number out, my contact information. I'm willing to talk with anyone that wants to do that career. Perfect. Cause like I said, representation does matter. And I think if, if you can see somebody who looks like you, it kind of makes your dream a little bit more achievable. Um, if you can see somebody who definitely looks like you. Um, thank you to the person who came back into the group and readdress that question because you kind of threw me off. So the question was, what yearly screenings do you recommend? And that's to both of you. So 
So if you are 21 and over, you can do your pap test. Um, starting at 40, you can do your mammograms. Uh, 50 or even 45, you can do your um, colon, colonoscopy. So um, I recommend if you fall into those age groups to make sure you get those screenings. And of course, you know, I'm going to say, see your dentist, get a um, checkup for your, you know, for cavities and then for oral cancer, both, you know, regular oral cancer, your tongue, lips, and then oral pharyngeal cancer, tonsils, and back of your throat. Ms. Ava, you spoke earlier um, about vaccines. That's a big subject going on in the country right now. What are your thoughts on vaccination in the African-American community specifically? Um, we tend to not want them. <laughs> um, we tend to not want to get them. Um, and COVID is no exception. HPV is no exception. Um, but again, the more people um, participate or the more African Americans that participate in these clinical trials, the more we can say that this, you know, that vaccination is effective in that community. Um, so it's a matter of education because um, a lot of people, even with the flu shot, they continue to not get it because, oh, I'll get the flu. So it's a lot about educating them about what it is and the importance of it. So it's just continue to educate because there's a lot of miscommunication out there as far as its effectiveness and safety. And a follow-up question to that, what can make me feel secure? Because there's been so much that has happened. I asked this question yesterday as well, but there's been so much that has happened in historically times where I didn't feel comfortable getting a vaccine. You know, I'm not comfortable because Tuskegee, you know, a lot more. And I think Tuskegee is just the, the highlight, but there are so many others out there that um that have been, you know, misguided when it comes to like, hey, we're going to give you this for this, but it doesn't really work. How in this day and age can I feel comfortable saying, you know what, I'm going to agree to to do this? What is what is in place for me to make me feel comfortable? So being available and answering the questions honestly, um, and then setting the example. So I oftentimes go back to, you know, those influencers. So if you've been watching the news about uh, President Obama saying he's going to be the first in line to, you know, get the vaccinate, the COVID vaccination. So it's seeing those influential leaders who actually get the vaccination and then tell their story as to, you know, you know, I'm fine. This is fine. It's going to be okay. And then having someone that they trust to communicate the effect of, again, the effect, because it's all about who, who, who communicates it and how. So, um, and just be the example and let those people, you know, prove to those naysayers or those who are skeptical that it's okay. And I think I definitely have to agree with you. I think sometimes it does depend on who is giving you the information. Um, right. Because I have an African-American doctor, he's a male doctor. And I'm for sure I, I would consider it, you know, if he said, hey, I believe in this I, because he's my messenger and I trust him already. So I think it's all about who the messenger is that can really get us to understand more. All right. Yes. Another question. Do the vaccines have a live virus? You're saying the, the current one? I'm not for sure. Just a question. Do the vaccines have a live virus? Like the yes. flu? And they did, they did say, they did say yes, the current one. So I don't, I don't, I'm not sure. So I'm not going to say, but I know the flu is a big one that people always say, and there's no live virus in the flu vaccination. All right, perfect. All right. Um, again, if you have any other questions, please let us, please feel free to put in the chat or in our question. Um, we will say there is information located in the chat as well for Moffitt Cancer Center. Um, I think people asked for it earlier. That's going to be one eight eight. 663-3488 or you can go to moffitt.org for any from any follow-ups or any information that you may need. Um, a lot of great information um, that is going out um, as well. I guess the I guess the f another question out there um, is we say things change. We see a lot of things change over the years. Um, how has dentistry changed over the years? And I know 
somebody put in the chat about wooden teeth uh, out there as well. But how has dentistry changed over the years? Wow, that's a really good question. I think that we're no longer practicing in silos. I think more and more people are seeing that dentistry is part of, like oral health is part of overall health, that you can't be healthy without good oral health. So I think that people now understand that more. Um, and I know that dentistry is also like we're bridging into other fields. So I have some friends in the sisters group that I'm in that are doing cosmetic things like Botox and fillers as dentists, um, others that are doing sleep apnea um, and appliances as dentists. And then even lasers in dentistry now that they're using to cut um, kids that are born with tongue ties. So babies who don't latch on because their tongues aren't um, free enough to actually um, latch on to the mother to nurse. So I think dentistry is kind of evolving and taking its rightful place as a niche within overall health. And, um, and we're seeing the impacts of that just that I'm even here today. So I want to thank you all for getting us, you know, having dentistry on um, at the table. A lot of times we were kind of in the corner pushed to the side. So I think now people are realizing that it's important to practice our oral health. So thank you. But I didn't address wooden teeth. So I should say that, yeah, we have implants, we have lasers, um, we have 3D cone beam, cone beam images where we can actually take an image of your mouth and see your teeth like from all different angles. Um, we use that for implants. So a lot of different technologies um, that are being used in dentistry um, than, than from before. And, and even some friends that do laser dentistry where they don't use um, a drill. So, you know, a traditional drill that is supposedly painful. And so they don't even have to give you anesthesia. They can just do that without anesthesia so it's pain-free. And then a lot of dentists who are doing sleep dentistry and like boutique style, so they can actually sedate you. Um, my dad had that done where he was kind of put into a twilight zone to just get his work done. So that's another part of dentistry I think that's changed. So I'd say a kinder, gentler, more friendlier dentistry. Um, and I think also we have a lot more women dentists too. So that's one more thing I would say that I like to see in the field that now the dental school, when I go back every year to talk, is about 55% female. Nice, nice, nice. And I'm for sure you're getting more, you know, especially with COVID. Um, you're probably getting a lot more people who are realizing their oral health because they got to wear this mask and they can smell what we smell for years now because it's coming back at them. So, uh, so I know a lot of people are, you know, so I know your dentistry practice is going up high. So, all right, besides that, <laughs> if we can, let's do closing, let's do closing statements from both of you. Um, we thank you all for being here. Um, so we'll give it to you, Ms. Avery, and then end it with you, Dr. Tibby, for any closing remarks. Uh, again, thank you for allowing me to participate. Um, and then if I was to say anything, I would say be your own champion. Um, make sure you know your body, you listen to your body, and you get those screenings every year um, that are age appropriate. Um, and make sure, you know, so that if it's early, you know, detected early, you can have greater and better health outcomes. So thank you again. I'm going to say, before we get to Dr. Tip, I'm sorry, because you said something that was really, really great. Um, how do you be your own advocate? How do you, how do, you do that and, and not feel intimidated or not feel like you, how, how do you do that? What are some things you can empower people with? So make sure, and, and that goes back to when someone asked about make, how to get the best doctor, is that you can't be intimidated because they're in that white coat. Um, and you know your body better than anyone else. So you have to make sure that when you go in there, because a lot of times, sometimes, I know even for my parents, they don't go in there and we'll, you know, being in my profession, I would kind of help prepare them and, you know, get their questions ahead of time. And then they'll go in there and don't say anything. But then I'll follow up. So you need to make sure that, again, you know your body and you ask those appropriate questions to get the help that you need. Um, and don't rely on them to say, well, you know, you don't need that. Um, you know, you're okay, you're fine, and they dismiss you, and then you go on about your business, and then you come back later, and it's an advanced stage or whatever the case may be. So when I say be your own, just make sure you don't take no if you feel like something is wrong. Like, you do, you do your research, you ask the right questions, and make sure your voice is heard in your care and you play that point person for your care and no one else. Perfect. Thank you. Dr. Tibby, last words. 
My last words, I think I had to go back to what my mom would always say, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So what we do now will really stop us from having those additional costs, additional burden of disease, pain, and so forth. So getting these screenings, I think it's really great that we had a conversation about screenings can be life-saving. Um, almost half of all cancers, if we just do prevention, they can be prevented. That's colorectal cancer, that's oral cancer, um, whether it means you get a vaccine like HPV to do that or you get regular screenings. Um, but this, we're talking about prevention. So I would say just as Ms. Uh, Avery mentioned, you know, really be an advocate for yourself. Let's, let's partner together to prevent these from occurring in the first place. And then when you're going somewhere, bring a friend, bring a colleague, bring someone along with you. Um, we want to take people along with us because in our communities, a lot of times people are just kind of in, um, right now isolated. So I would say call that friend, check on them, and remind them to get in to see the dentist and their healthcare provider. All right, perfect. All right, as always, we thank everyone for being here today with us. Um, be sure to join us tomorrow at 1230 as we'll be discussing integrative health um, with some great, great panelists as we saw today. In addition, if you need more information or if you want to look at this um, program again, be sure to check us out on USF Black Alumni Society Facebook page and or USF Alumni Association website, which is www.usfalumni.org and the on demand section. So again, we want to thank Dr. Tibby and Ms. Avery for this great, great presentation and this great discussion on health and oral screening. So again, thank you all. We'll see all of you tomorrow. Have a good one, everybody. Thank you.